all right welcome welcome another one welcome uh as you approach energy avenue maji coming at you um another book this is uh metal nature uh-huh let's see oh see if i can get it up here all right i got a lot of little pictures on this one so yeah this is by david carruthers uh awesome guy written in uh let's see here mm -hmm. take my time too all right first published uh in britain okay 95 all right yeah so let's uh jump into carruthers here got pictures of everybody so yeah so it starts off with um a little story by him and I, i'll give this uh like analogy like the first book of his i read was intellectual warfare which was great but it was not what i expected and again, this one is the same thing. But now I'm beginning to understand his writing where it's like he is putting you in the middle of a conversation that you may or may not be ready for. And so I had one idea about what this book was going to be. Um, Meta Nature, Divine Speech, a, histori a historiographical reflection on African deep thought from the time of the pharaohs to the present. I didn't really pay much attention to the the whole historiographical reflection of African deep thought part. I was just like, ooh, men of nature, hieroglyphics. Oh, boy. So much more than I anticipated. Great stuff. Um, yeah, look him up, man. He he has a hell of a story. I'm not going to give much on him. Um, so you got part one, the divine conversation. Part two, non-petition of the farmer whose speech is good. No, part two is good speech. And that's a part of... Um, Part two is the nine petitions, which is really cool. And then, yeah, that's that's it. It's just two parts. So the foreword he has done by um, John Henry Clark. And they share the same initials, which is crazy, right? So um, Jacob, J-H-C and J-H-C. So let me show you Clark. He's the man. It's a young picture of him. <laughs> Union Springs, Alabama. Let's go. So some of the stuff he says... Uh, he said, um, see, Northeast Africa and Western Africa were a part of the same geography and therefore a part of the same cultural system. Um, the early civilizations of the Tigris and Euphrates, Euphrates Valleys had their origins in Nile Valley uh, civilizations. Too many times there is the assumption that the philosopher has an all-seeing eye, an all-knowing brain, and that all he needs are listeners. In African philosophy, the philosopher is both a speaker and a part of the listening audience. His humanity is not separated from his listeners because the African philosopher understands that he is an extension of his constituency and that his constituency is an extension of his humanity. That stuck out to me because a lot of times when you read these things, Eurocentric in nature, basically, all things philosophy, it's like this person is an authority. We just grant an authority to this person. So he's really countering that narrative with that um, with that quote. Um, and basically he says, uh, so all this stuff, he said in motion, like Carruthers is said in motion, a process of reexamining history in the favor of its victims. And that always makes me think about trees, because when we think about history, we may have one idea of it, but if every different aspect of this earth this world could write its own history it would sound completely different if trees wrote their history oh my god how different would history sound you know um so history in favor of its victims i mean okay last quote from from uh so carruthers let's see one quote from him um african champions must break that must break the chain that links African ideas to European ideas and listen to the voice of the ancestors without European interpreters. Okay, so uh, jumping into the uh, introduction here. Um, so the book really starts out, man, the whole idea of philosophy. And I was like, why are we talking about philosophy so much? But when you're talking about divine speech and, and the men of nature, it's incredible the link there and so he goes into that let's go um so he breaks down let's see continental africans we must of course point out that among continental africans the nationalist designation 
has absorbed the former integrationists who need who indeed have in many cases dominated the African nations. Um, hence each stream, so he breaks them into different camps. Hence the uh, both camps answer the first question in the positive, but differ pro profoundly on the latter question. Hence each stream embarks on a quest for African philosophy, one in Africa's past and the other in its future. This great African debate epitomizes the basic division among African leaders not only at the level of deep thought, but also at the level level of political theory. So he's diving into the conversation. And just like in intellectual warfare, he's really going into a lot of African thinkers. He's not writing from just his own opinions on anything. He's uh, engaging in the conversations with his contemporaries and with his ancestors, which he did in intellectual warfare. Um, so I love that. Uh, he has another book that I want to get, uh, Science and Oppression, um, probably at some point. Um, divine Revelation may be considered divine speech. So we're in chapter one now. The debate over f philosophy divides African thinkers into two camps. Um, those who reject the idea of African traditional philosophy and those who defend the idea of African traditional philosophy. And then he gets into a brother named E. Franklin Frazier. I got to show these guys, man. Let's see. Ooh, look at that picture. Boy, the man looking clean. Even the, okay, the remastery of it is nice, too. Uh, this this guy, uh, like, not too long ago, as you can tell from the from the quality. So this, this is like early 20th century, mid 20th century. This guy. Uh, now, E. Franklin Fazer, he says, falls outside of the debate, but he sets a good framework for the discussion. Um, so one quote from Fraser, Check it out. The American Negro intellectual goes his merry way discussing such matters as the superficial aspects of the material standard of living among Negroes and the extent to which they enjoy civil rights. He never begins with the fundamental fact of what slavery has done to the Negro or the group which is called Negroes in the United States. That's 1973. So another result is the fact that they have, quote, they have failed to study the problems of Negro life in, in America in a manner which would place the fate of the Negro in the broad framework of man's experience in the world. So there's this, end quote, uh, so there's this, um, dissociation of past of the past like you, you could think 16 9, 19 project where you're getting a lot of history as it pertains to formerly enslaved people in America without a really deep understanding of everything before that time I mean it's still good information but there's a context for these conversations so he's really diving into it okay something else that um Frazier said under the slavery regime and for nearly a century since emancipation, everything in American society has stamped the Negro as subhuman, as a member of an inferior race that had not achieved even the first steps in civilization. Um, and that's what Black History Month looks like for most people. It's not about anything prior to the U.S. It's about only the stuff that we've been doing here. Um, so E. Franklin Frazier says, dig down into the experience of the Negro and bring about a transvaluation of that experience. Now, when I read that, dig down into the experience of the Negro. All I could hear, all I could hear was Marcus Garvey. And uh, so let me just uh, read a little quote from Marcus Garvey here, which is not in this book, but it's just great. <laughs> Dive down, black man, and dig. Reach up, black men and women, and pull out nature's knowledge to you. Turn ye around and make an account for everything north and south, east and west. Then when you have wrought well, you will have merited God's blessing. You will have become God's chosen people. And naturally you become the leaders of the world because of the superiority of your minds and your achievements. Liberate the minds of men and ultimately you will liberate the bodies of men. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. All right, so that's, that's a little Marcus Garvey. All right, back to Franklin Frazier. Um, okay, so now he goes into um, the African authentic philosophers. Unlike Fraser, they are critical of continental African thought. Um, and he talks about like these different approaches. So 
one approach is this uh, philosophic sagacity by Oroka. Odera Uruka. I got a picture of him. Here he is. So these are great African thinkers from Africa now. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just great. So this is like in, when was that guy talking? Oroka was, uh, I want to say, mm, 84 or something. These men are critical independent thinkers who guide their thought and judgments by the power of reason and inborn insight rather than the authority of the communal consensus. Okay, so that's the idea of, of the philosophic sagacity. So the, the kind of Eurocentric idea where, you know, like the Plato said this or the Aristotle said this. Therefore, oh, they're right because of their reason and their logic and the way that their mind works. And, oh, that makes total sense. So they are correct. It has nothing to do with group experience, with the communal um, consensus. Okay, so a third approach is what Odera Uruka calls nationalist ideological philosophy, epitomized by Kwame Nkrumah, seeks to evolve a new unique political theory based upon traditional African socialism and family. Theory. So that's like in his book, um, Consciousism, which I did, um, Kwame Nkrumah, Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah. Okay, let's keep going. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Okay, he's also getting into um, George and Jim James. So a lot of guys. So, and I hadn't found a good picture of my side of this one. You know, the little sketch, the little black and white George Jim James stolen legacy. Uh, let's see. He further reinforces the arguments of George Jim James that the tradition of deep thinking represented by philosophy was foreign to Greek life. Uh, he's talking about Obinga, um, Theophile Obinga. Obinga, who is still alive, by the way. Obinga finally demonstrates that the true philosophical character was indigenous to Kemet. Um, let's see. African intellectuals who practice philosophy in the narrow sense actually express European deep thought, i.e. European philosophy. Nothing more or less. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let me show you um, Theophile Obinga. He uh, talks a lot about Obenga because that's his contemporary. And um, uh, he has just done so much work from from the translations to uh, of the um, of Middle Egyptian from the papyri and from the temples and all that to I mean, he also is fluent in French, you know, because he's, I believe, from Senegal. And I love this picture of him because it's him and his study, man. It's like Dr. Greg Carr sitting in his office, books everywhere because that's what they do. They study. Um, okay. Let's keep going. Now, this is a section of the champions of African deep thought. Oh, I didn't have anything in there. The African thinkers of the diaspora. Okay. So now he's talking about um, 1797, Prince Hall. Let me show a little Prince picture of Prince Hall. If we're talking about... Uh, you know, the Prince Hall Masons and uh, all them guys, you know what I'm saying? 1797, when Prince, Paul, Prince Hall, who was born in Barbados in the Caribbean, gave a charge to those Africans in America that he had inducted into the Africa Lodge, Lodge, which he established, regarding their duty as liberators of African slaves. He connected them to the wisdom of ancient Ethiopia and the inspiring action of the Haitian revolutionaries. He thus articulated a framework which would guide the thought of the 19th century African nationalism. So you, you think about Greek Masons and or you think about Masons in that context of Prince Hall. You're like, oh, and the people from from the islands and the history of Haiti. And you're like, oh, that's what I'm falling in line with. I mean, I would hope so, right? If I'm getting involved with them. Now, he has a whole list of people that he's uh, introducing. Um, and I'll just mention Baron P.V. Vasti, born 1781. Um, Desalines, um, Henry Christoph, uh, Prince Sanders, who in 1816 left the United States to live in the Caribbean. Then he goes to David Walker. I had to go ahead and get a picture of Walker here. Where is he? Because uh, I had never seen him before, so boom. You got David Walker, um, who uh, 
launching this call for an African American rebellion like the one in Haiti. You know, he was the one that wrote the letters and stuff in the U.S. So, I definitely recommend checking him out. Uh, let's see. Hosea Easton, 1837. Preempted another of... Okay, all right. Let's just keep going here. Let's see. Ooh, I got a star right here. Oh, yeah. He mentioned... I mean, just like... Now, all these are men that he's talking about. Pretty much throughout the whole book, he's on talking about men. But uh, it definitely reminded me, in a lot of ways, he goes into his, like, section on alienation, um, which kind of goes... Speaking about the European mindset of alienation into philosophy and religion, blah, blah, blah. Sounds a lot like Marimba Ani. I was just like, oh, yeah. Um, so I definitely recommend that book, uh, Yoruga. Okay. But, yeah, he mentions Dr. Ben and his African origin of major Western religions, which I read. But uh, I don't have it with me. I definitely need to do a review of that one. That was a good one. Okay. He, um... Is relying on the Shabaka stone, the, the Shabaka text. Because Carruthers has done all these translations himself. He's only using his translations. Now, he does credit Faulkner with um, his concise dictionary of uh, like Middle Egyptian or of hieroglyphics or something. So that's where like he learned a lot of his translation, like words, phrases, blah, blah, blah. But he did the, he redid translations and reinterpreted them. So he's critiquing a lot of the interpretations of Medunetra, of hieroglyphics, of good speech, that, that whole idea. Um, so he says a lot about this stone, which you can't really see all the hieroglyphics. So then you can see on this one what they were able to salvage from it, right? So he translated all this stuff, all of that, right? And he's saying, um, let's see, some of the stuff he says, the concept of the four basic elements, earth, fire, earth, water, fire, and the air also came from Kemet, as James asserted, George M. James. Um, no text from Kemet so far indicates that the Kemites ever reduced the material universe to any number of basic elements. He also takes issue with Professor Diop. Oh, let's look at Diop real quick. Now, so not only does he talk about or with his contemporaries, he also takes issue with them because that's what a conversation looks like. I agree with you here. I disagree with you here. And just like in intellectual warfare, he does that a lot with all his contemporaries. He's he's critiquing some things and he's uh, um, in full agreement on others. So with Diop, my man. Looking like uh, D'Angelo or something about to sing Brown Sugar. I guess high all the love, don't know how to be yeah. I mean, it's just a cool ass picture. Anyway, he um he uh, keeps coming back to Diop, Senegalese uh, scholar called like the, I mean, he is the man, the man. That's why he needs to be spoke about so often. Um, Let's see. Here he says, so and I'm still talking about Carruthers now. He's saying uh, such a reading is even more problematic in his critique of Diop. He's still critiquing, critiquing Diop. Um, such a reading is even more problematic with concepts like the highest good and the law of opposites. These ideas are, are very Greek, but they cannot be explicitly found in the Kemetic texts, at least not in the one cited. So there I've already heard these. Um, what's his name? What's the dude name? R.J. Schwaller de Lubix. He talks a lot about those opposites. How it's not about opposites, it's about compliments. So Carruthers actually echoes him in, in a lot of what he says about that. That's coming up. He said, uh, the Greeks may have derived their elements from the quartet, but only because they did not really understand the deep thoughts of Kemet. Diop asserted that Wasir and Aset begot humanity while Setek begot evil. I have argued that this is a European interpretation. The European interpretation is based upon the account of the conflict between Hor and Saket by Plutarch. So that was just cool because uh, I just love to hear those critiques. Like why, why uh, study all the things they study? Why go and learn Medunetra from 
beginning to end like well we already got people to translate it why translate because you may not be able to um you may not agree with those interpretations and if you're going to stand on the shoulders of these giants then you got to climb up their feet their knees their legs their waist their arms you got to get to the shoulders you don't just stand up there climb you know um anyway the Oak next explained the comedic concept of being as in the human being there are three major egos the ket and the psychological being the ba the body soul and the shit the shadow in addition there is also the ka or the immortal principle i just love that i've read that and now it's more part of my understanding so i'm like yep i knew that yeah 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 thus each individual has a portion of divinity i.e is truly in the image of god this book really helped me with my um with my deep image and perception of what god is especially in the context of ancient african civilization oh it's so good we ain't even got to the good speech yet i mean okay thus the african scholars adapted or adopted the greek uh philosophical course of study and quoted aristotle um yeah so he's talking like how you can see how he can tell that a lot of the african thinkers now and leaders are really quoting from a european mindset with no um rejecting or not knowing the african traditions or divine speech good speech all right uh diop's disciples uh he mentions some people there using different languages alienation itself um okay i'll keep going still in a um, modern african thinking about african thought so the conclusion here of this chapter um deep thinking has nonetheless occurred so whether it's uh um disregarding the african history whether it's philosophical thought in the context of a european ideal now he's saying deep thinking has nonetheless occurred okay and then he goes back to those camps First of all, both schools affirm the existence of African philosophy in some sense. There, right there, the agreement virtually ends. Both imply that the other camp brings European baggage into the arena. Um, I was just like, man, that, that reminds me of the two-party system, like how we can be so polarized on that. Okay. Diop's inconsistency on Nun and Nunet is as follows. He defines them as the primordial primordial waters and their opposite matter and nothingness. The concept of nothingness is inconsistent with his statement concerning the comedic concept of creation. The universe is not created ex nihilio, you know, from nothing. Uh, Obinga's inconsistency, uh, he goes into that, so I'm not going to go into it, but that was just cool that he's catching the inconsistencies because a lot of times and i've done this like listen to a preacher for instance they'll say something in the sermon and you like yes they'll say something 10 minutes later you're like yes not even in the right mindset to hear implicit inconsistencies or contradictions because everything that this person is saying to me i am going to accept you know and that's not how he approaches his african brothers his african leaders his african thinkers He's very critical. He demonstrates critical thought throughout his entire book or both books so far. So I love that. He says, uh, I further suggest that there is no law of opposites in comedic thought. Male and female are not opposite, but complementary, just as time and infinity. And I just put a note time and space because uh, I forgot what it was I was reading. But anyway, uh, OK, so these dualistic conceptions oh when i was reading about the yoga yeah so, so they talk about the time and space in regards to uh moving outside of um your being when you're reaching a certain state in meditation that you're rising above time and space so you're approaching that infinite you're, you're approaching god that cosmic intelligence that force you're approaching that and it separates you from the time and space and uh that is totally in line with um, what this divine speech and what God is in the context of this book. I mean, 
Let's just go. Okay, okay. In my opinion, all dimensions of the spectrum from infinitude to finitude, both time and space, are symbolized by the couple, not separately, as suggested by the concept of opposites, but as male and female sharing in all attributes well, of time and space. Um, fast forwarding. Oh, I put a big, big note here. Just, okay. Therefore, my suggestion is let us put it aside and use a term which can be found in the comedic vocabulary. That term, as previously stated, and as will be amplified below, is metu nature. Um, therefore, let the young philosophers and their European mentors keep their philosophy, and we will keep our African thought. And that is really the introduction to the discussion. Because I was like, I don't know what I'm getting into in this book. But that was like the intro. Um, but the Kemites did not use a comedic term that may be translated as love of wisdom to denominate their deep thought. They did, however, use two terms that denoted their deepest thoughts. Those words are Medunetra, divine speech, and Medunefer, good speech. I'm suggesting we use the terminology they used. And it's not for no reason he is getting into it. So, um, chapter two is Metanetra. Um Let's see. Plato earlier had attributed a version of the legend to Socrates, but certainly the pursuit of wisdom among the Greeks was substantially different from that among the Kemites, as indicated above. So, I didn't need to go deep into that because I've read about that and I see the differences. I see it. <laughs> I have read enough especially from marimba and she breaks all of that down um and so does george m james okay metanature is the comedic concept which is used to denote the formal written language so that is the hieroglyphics okay um yeah so the shabaka stone or shabaka text which is like from 2700 years ago uh around 700 bc They've also entitled that text the Memphite Theology. So what I began to see here is that um, there are a lot of different translations, even for the titles. So when I was searching out like pictures and stuff, and I realized that, oh, he's talking about this. He's talking about the, uh, the Papyrus of Rani, or, or he's talking about the Book of Coming Forth by Day. Or I mean, it's a lot of names for this stuff. Um, but the Shabaka text was written uh, on a plaque in the Temple of Ptah, so that's cool. Now, this is why I think people should really get this book, too, because he's showing you the translations. Like, he's going line by line. Same way that um, Theophilo Binga did in his book um, about, um, oh, man, the African sciences. Uh, it's one of the first books I read. I can't remember. I translated from the French though, so it's written in French. It's, it's about yeah. Anyway, get the Afalo Bingas books, man. Um, the wisdom of Shabaka begins with the recognition that experience, defined as sensory perception, is an initiator of the process of knowing. Now, this is a personal thing. Sensory perception—that's the individual. That's the initiator. To the process of knowing um and it's just like the way they oh mm, okay let's keep going you can't get the full grasp until you read it all of course but i hope someone has read it maybe they can expound on some of the stuff that i've noticed um good speech is therefore an intergenerational conversation which began septepi i.e on the first occasion when existence began so he goes into the septepi so he calls the book um, so the book of Come Forth by Day, he calls it the book of Ma Keru. And these are all different parts of the whole the whole thing. Like the book of Come Forth by Day is like, oh yeah, I got a picture of one of the pages in there. Um, but this thing is, I got this book at home, which you can get for like $30 or something. But it's like 120 pages. And it's just bass relief after relief. like, And it's all colored in, like redone looking almost original you know what i'm saying but uh that it is a lot it is a lot so this is just one so when he talks about the septap he, he's talking about one section of probably one relief that's not you know the whole thing um let us begin with the 
the, oh, and this picture, by the way, is the one with the scales. You know, you can see um, Jehudi. And uh, anyway, okay, okay now we're getting to it. Let us begin with the paradox of the human experience. Externity and time. On the one hand, humanity experiences the everlastingness of cosmic events. On the other hand, the regular recurrence of those events conveys the sense of time, which seems to contradict which seems to contradict the sense of eternity. That's just right in line with the yoga. Man, it's just right in line with the yoga. Um, so the Kemites had established a solar calendar at the dawn of history. Uh, I just like that because uh, the astrology aspect of everything that I do now is very clear. And like, what season am I actually in? And I feel like coming into spring of 23 right now with the sun being born, getting close to this uh, spring equinox. I'm like, I think I feel it this year. <laughs> this has been a fall to remember. Okay, anyway. Um, the Eight Infinite Ones, the literal translation of the designation in the Book of the Voices is true. Okay, sorry, now nah, we'll skip that one. It is therefore my argument that the opposite's concept of change is basically non-African in origin and comes from the metaphysical and physical alienation that characterize the Eurasian worldview. Now, he does take a couple of different steps about this European alienation than Marimba Ani in the context of meta nature. Um, and that'll become a little more clear. Maybe I'll explain it, but maybe you'll get it yourself and read it. Um, in fact, the title Book of Coming Forth by Day should be considered as possibly referring to speech, especially if one considers the divine formula of the Hotep Dinesu, which evokes divinity thusly. And he puts the actual uh, translation from the hieroglyphics. Uh, the books of Instruction. Who are we talking about here? Who is this guy? Karinga. Oh, I was going to get a picture of him. Um, he said, oh, well, the text. So he has a lot of translations from this text, right? Instruction of Patahotep. Um, they did not know to leave heirs, children that might repeat their names. Instead, they made heirs out of the books of instruction, which they composed. So this goes right in line with hearing that your ancestors live through you speaking their names. That a person is not dead until their name is no longer uttered. Uh, this is a very similar um, context to that. Instead, they made heirs out of the books of instruction. And so the speech was the thing, and this is my interpretation, but the speech is more important than the person. And so when you're talking about divine speech, when you're talking about God, it is uh, providing that eternity in word and speech that is much more important um, than the vessel. So you don't see as many names, but you see the book. Uh, human arrogance is always checked by the knowledge that the limit of good speech is never achieved. There is always room for growth, according to the wisdom of Patahotep. Um, talks about some other books, so he talks about some other texts, other <laughs> other texts. Um, all right, we're still in chapter two now. What is significant is that these written recitations of deeds and accomplishments convey a sense of history and historiography based upon continuity of the tradition of peace and building, with only minor emphasis on warfare. So that's the history. And that, of course, made me think about how we learn history now, always in the context of war. Like, what do you know about history? Oh, well, I know the war of this, and I know when we got independence from here, and I got to When uh, the emphasis there in Africa was uh, continuity of the tradition of peace and building. And when, you, when I started to study like, the history of China, it's a very similar story to that of Africa in that because they weren't focused on warfare, they were um, subject to European nations at some point in their history. Um, in the case of China, the Opium Wars um, in, in the 1930s, after being so far along industrially and with like factorization without using that name, with um, just their economy, their 
markets just the way i mean they were just blooming and then introduce drugs introduce warfare let's knock you down a pig you know um anyway so it just makes me think about in going forward i don't think there's any way to not live in this world like the same way that americans have to well i'm still going to get a gun even though we got so many guns and guns are a problem i gotta get a gun <laughs> you know it's, it's we in it now i don't know anyway uh he talks about mathematics medicine so he goes into the other metonature the other hieroglyphic texts so the Rhine papyrus um talks about uh the medical papyrus uh which he doesn't go deep into like Diop goes more in depth on a lot of those six than he does here but he's just talking about the divine conversation how these texts um, incorporate good speech modeling good speech uh, he says uh, thus mathematics is perhaps the most nearly perfect model of good speech there's a great quote coming up from an African thinker in regards to mathematics and um, speech that uh, made me think about rappers and it's just going to be really good. Uh, let's see. Alexandria, Serene, and Carthage were the preferred centers of theological speculation during the early Christian era. When Islam came, the universities of Cairo and Sankore rose to unequal status. I only uh, mark that because I would love to know more about those universities and Islam. So he also has a nice table of uh, Egyptian cosmology, cosmogony and the... Uh, nine divine ones um but yeah i would recommend um dr fukia for the african cosmo cosmology okay so now he gets into now this is really cool this is really cool now we're going to go to uh this african map here so we can see what we're talking about this stuff because uh he just runs the gamut like so reading the book and probably listening to it too, it's hard to really know uh, where the story is going, right? But as you keep reading, it's like it just the picture becomes clear. So here in chapter three, he's talking about the deep thought of basic Africa. So he's going around Africa, talking around about different groups of people in Africa and their thoughts there. So without going into um, deep things about each one i'm just gonna show the areas that uh he talked about so one he went to the dinka the dinka were off of the uh blue nile and i thought i knew what the blue nile was <laughs> it's the blue nile and the white nile and uh man i'm just showing how much i don't know right now was it over here? Is it close to Ethiopia? No, it's like kind of close to Egypt. Okay, okay. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Come on, come on. It's Lake Nasser. Man. Now how I'm going to not find the longest river? Lord of mercy. Lord of mercy. Alright, well, uh, yeah, let's just say um, East African end. Okay, so we got the dink over there. Um, the southern reaches of the White Nile River. I could probably type it in, but I would rather just go ahead and be embarrassed at this point. Let me just let me just do that. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the beliefs there, but it's definitely showing the cohesion of how speech um, plays a crucial role in their ideas of divinity. Okay, he says, uh, thus the relationship between the divinity and humanity is a divine conversation which began or begins with the creation, i.e. the uttering of the name of humanity. And of course, I started to hear the little, uh, the um, remnants of um, Christianity, all the little things I grew up with, you know, in the beginning. What? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Preach, preacher. Okay. So, and then he goes to the go, uh, the Dogon people of Mali. So, Mali, you got Dogon people over here. So, he goes from East Africa to West Africa. Now, he also says how he has to rely on a lot of European um, anthropologists and historians about these stories of these African tribes because Africans didn't um, record these things 
back then everything was oral and with the genocidal history that is african a lot of these oral traditions of course were lost and so he had to lean on a lot of european historians so he's reinterpreting their um their observations though so he's just not quoting them he's like well they said this but really this shows this you know so he, he's, he's kind of doing that um you got the dogon people of mali oh and he's also you and using diop there um what is of special significance is the scientific precision of the dogon knowledge of the star sirius which is the basis of the comedic tradition which established the solar calendar uh let's see talks about the number eight and divine speech how they're united it's, it's a little numerology around going on uh the eighth is speech itself which enables the other seven but the seventh is a master no nah, i'm not going to get to that okay and then he goes into african reflections on traditional speech um so here's this guy i want to show this guy because he's the one who said this quote oh yeah about the word and about math uh let's see is it yeah kizerba this dude right here um he says so oral tradition is not just a second best source to be resorted to only when there is nothing else it is a distinct source in itself with a now well established methodology and it lends the history of the African continent a marked originality that wasn't even the one that wasn't even the quote it's coming up. Uh, but that's that's still good. Because I was just talking about how the oral tradition. Yeah. So speaking was close to God. So if you're speaking correctly, you're passing on God to your um, progeny. I mean, it's good stuff. Um, the Yoruba. So let's go back to Africa. So now, the Yoruba... Um, as well as a couple more, all both in West Africa. Uh, so he talks about Yoruba, Y O R U B A, um, how the priest um, had to master 246 Odus, um, which were like this body of literature must not only be memorized but be but must be chanted with specific intonations and a complex variety of language styles so that was very similar to what you see in um, Islam today right or in Hebrews um, chanting all the verses and stuff um, so then he goes to the Igbo I-G-B-O also West Africa um, it talks about their God and let's see I put a star here he he believes they are the inventions of priests who usurp communication with Onyame, which is their name for God, by becoming mouthpieces for these superstitiously based gods and thus corrupting the unity between humanity and divinity. Um. Okay. No, no. I do like the fact that uh, <laughs> the word. Also, oh, now we're with the. Uh, a kind people so we talked about yoruba the igbo we talked about the um let me go back make sure the dinka and the dogon dinka dogon yoruga or oh, sorry yoruba igbo and now the akan and the akan are also west african and so they have a word <laughs> okra O-K-R-A, uh, that's destiny, which like the Ka among the Kemites departed at death to rejoin God. So okra, like Ka, is also associated with the breath of life. So now when I'm eating okra, I'm like, man, let me get some of that breath of life. Like my um, brothers and sisters in West Africa would say about okra, destiny. <laughs> and I wonder if that's where we got a name from. Who knows? I mean, probably. Lastly, he talks about this group, um, the Soto Tswana in Southern Africa. Um, and again, all this has to do with how they perceive divinity and how that divinity is related to speech and the commonalities there. 
Oh, that's not lastly. Then he also goes to the Gikuyu. And uh, this is in um, this is in East Africa now. So we're talking about Kenya and like Central running around this area. So he talks about like Jomo Kenyatta and um, facing Mount Kenya, which my cousin really keeps telling me to read. I got to read that book. All right. Uh, he concluded his discussion of Gikuyu spirituality by noting that the community had lost its unity. Hence, it cannot speak with God with its full contingent of voices. Uh, that's Kenyatta. The reverse may also be true that a community has lost its voice, its speech. Therefore, it has no longer, it no longer has unity. Uh, let's see. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay, here we go. So here's the quote from, uh, oh, it wasn't from, from that dude I showed at first. This one's from, um, Somebody that um, Dr. Carr talks about a lot, uh, who has a very cool picture, <laughs> Humbate Ba. He said, For just as Ma Ingala's divine speech animated the cosmic forces that lay static in Ma, so man's speech animates, sets in motion, and rouses the forces that are static in things. But for spoken words, to produce their full effect, they must be chanted rhythmically because movement needs rhythm, which is itself based on the secret of numbers. Speech must reproduce the to and fro that is the essence of rhythm. Let's go. I love that. Um, okay. And now we're getting back to Corellis. He said, uh, so the function of speech in African culture. Correct speech is essential in all spiritual activities. It ties each significant act to the cosmological worldview, which means giving to life. All acts of violence, such as cutting down a tree, must be accompanied by the correct words. Without correct words, the rituals are flawed and the activities are polluted. In this sense, spirituality and speech are inseparable inseparable thus speech is divine all right two notes here one he mentioned at the beginning of the book and i think i missed um saying this but he uh said how with martin luther king jr it's interesting that they called him uh eloquent but never profound similarly he goes on to talk about how when they're speaking about the european um the Egyptian texts, they're, you know, beautiful and artistic and da da da, but not profound. The the meaning of what was being said was never fully comprehended. And the exact same thing I see now in Martin Luther King. Everybody wants to talk about MLK Jr. and who he was, but who is diving into the words he said, the truth he was willing to die for, to die for. Those words, which he picked ever so carefully, those speeches, which he wrote out by nightlight, just like Malcolm X did, taking their time with the speeches, making sure their words hit poignantly. I mean, it's, you know, so all this made me think about that. Spirituality and speech are inseparable. So it is definitely, especially in African tradition, it's uh, worth dying to speak that truth and that's what the uh nine petitions to the farmer which is about to come up that's what the whole story alludes to which uh i'm not gonna go deep into because uh, i don't want the video to be too much longer but um it just confirms all of what i'm just saying right now okay anyway, all right. let's see let's see all right all right uh the utterances of the elders in general are subordinate only to god and the ancestors and under normal circumstances must be obeyed uh conclusion okay uh, this focus is based upon the contention that the tradition has withstood the many centuries of foreign intrusion domination and imposition and can be distinguished from what may have been borrowed from the muslims and christians so he's just saying like i didn't go into all of those like islamic and um, um, Christian histories about this. No, no, no. 
those could have had an influence too on where we are today but i wanted to get strictly with what was african so that's why he was talking about just the dogon and the igbo and the yoruba and the kikuya and uh the akan and the soto swana i think that's i think that's all of them okay Certainly, Professor Obinga is correct, but let us remember that the separation of the secular and the sacred is a false dichotomy visa a traditional Africa. Oh, he said this. Um, when discussing, Obinga said, Theophil Obinga, right? He said, uh, when discussing, oh, let me uh, show Obinga again in that office because that's just a good picture. I mean, why not? Right? Okay, he said, uh, when discussing ancient Egypt, it is always religion and never philosophy which is mentioned this fault can only be at can only be attributed to the interpreters of the egyptian texts african egyptologists must react against this tendency let us not reduce their important writings to a single dimension of the quote sacred the quote religious okay so he's saying it's always religion and never philosophy and those words themselves can be misnomers, right? So then, um, <clears throat> Carruthers says that he's correct, but I also remember he's just adding on to it. The separation of the secular and the sacred is a false dichotomy. Okay? Uh, one, all aspects of African life are sacred and everything is divine. Two, Africans have never originated any religion in which there is institutional slavery between a prophet and his God on the one hand and the adherents and the priests on the other. Now, that right there, that alienation, he starts to go into a little deeper. Um, throughout, we have encountered the concepts of eight and nine as sacred numbers. Bam, 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 bam. Okay, now he's getting into the metaphysics of alienation in chapter 4. So that's all that close to marimba and these stuff. There's a, I mean, once you see it, you can't unsee it, man. You just cannot unsee it. Uh, after the creation by naming, speech turns into a deceptive device whereby the gods trick humans into making wrong decisions. This story of the great flood which wipes out all mankind except one saved family underlies the concept of the chosen people, which is a bedrock. Of Western Asian religions, um, the divine tribe had all the advantages. The human tribe had nothing. This is the basic context of human alienation shared by the peoples of Mesopotamian antiquity outside Africa. Um, so, saying both of these stories reinforce the dominant theme of alienation. The role of speech is reduced to pathetic pleading or bitter lamenting and cursing. The universe is not ruled by the divine word but through divine and human force and oppression. Uh, let's see. Diop says, no, Carruther says of Diop. Provided the basis for a critique of European philosophy and science. The materialistic worldview of the Greeks led them to corrupt the Egyptian ideals and ideas. Their concept of God was debased. They had a pessimistic worldview. I mean, did I say more about that? I mean, so to hold on to some of those things, just like, I mean, once you know, just let it go. Just let it go and keep moving. You ain't got to hold on to it. Like, oh, that was kind of cancerous. Let me relieve myself of that. Um, strife between opponents, each equally overpowered by the third primal power, desire or will, is the motive force of mankind. Uh, he's, he's talking about European. I don't want to, I don't even care about that. Thus, intellectual anarchy was hopelessly entangled in the philosophic tradition as each philosopher attempted to impose order through his own aggressive speech. Speech was no longer divine. It was demonic. <laughs> demonic. Uh, yeah. Which is crazy because the Greek word theology means theo divine. Logos speech. <laughs> um, so yeah, if we're gonna talk about theology, we should really be talking about meta nature. Uh, I think that's the point there. Okay. 
Only through the empathy of male lovers could the inherent defects of speech be superseded. That is why so many of the platonic dialogues took place at homosexual gatherings. So, what? What did he just say? Um, modern European science. He um, starts talking about uh, science and oppression. I would just rather read that book. Um, the careful working over of nature is thus equated with exercising power or domain over things like I've read so much about the European and Western mode of thought that it's just like I'm good <laughs> when I keep reading about it. men who wanted to penetrate her secrets thus had to do more than speculate argue or orate they had to actually outwit her she's talking about nature um, they had to outwit her through rigid discipline and hard work and this endeavor man could take nothing for granted he must work fight every step of the way thus Speech is cast aside, and a science of dominion through detached observation and experimentation is established. Nature is no longer negotiated as a relative, but trodden down like an enemy. This is the essential spirit of modern science, the science of oppression. End scene. Uh, so that's conclusion here. And the man, these good words, oh, speak when you know you have a solution. This is one of the translations. If you are mighty, gain respect through knowledge and through gentleness of speech. <sighs> okay, I think I'm going to go to... Okay, so now part two is good speech. Um, some good historical stuff. I'm going to end with uh, just giving a little... I'll just tell you about the nine... Um, all right, no, I got a big star here. Nope, not going to go into it. It's just too good. The second part is the part. So, um, general principles of governance. Here's one. So, so it's not just a, a kind of historical um, conversation or just a um, abstract, uh, you know, critique of different things. No, there's also recipes. There's also like, what do we do now? So when I was reading this, my thought was, it would be an interesting exercise to go through different constitutions of different countries or of states and just see line by line what the change could be that would get it more in line with good speech. How would you shift the focus? What would just need to come all the way out? I mean, anyway. Uh, governance should be established upon the legitimacy of the traditions through convincing speech rather than on brute force. One almost uh, one could almost say that speech, education, and government are one and the same. All are gifts from the ancestors. I think that's just too separated from uh, what we're dealing with right now. Um, I just don't see how to just practically infiltrate the justice system law and justice in america speaking like that I, I just don't i mean the corruption is so deep um <clears throat> the pharaoh <clears throat> excuse me the pharaoh is admonished always to speak the truth so that the officials will respect the one to whom they are accountable because the front of the house puts respect in the rear in other words the example set by the governors will be accepted by the people and I, I put a star next to that because that is exactly what has happened. When I see corrupt people being accepted by the public, that is their permission. That is their license to be corrupt. Um, when I see people speaking truth killed, it is a refusal of the people to um, go by truth. Um, okay. Finally, the king is advised to show respect to God by building sacred monuments and promoting the spiritual life of the people by setting a good example of spirituality i mean so the nine um so i was just going to say so the nine petitions of the farmer is like showing that this farmer um who was only going to speak who was only speaking good speech divine speech he was requested to continue speaking because the truth needed to be said even though he was making um hits against his overseer or not so much an overseer but like the government um, the all of the officials above him and his low status because he as a farmer is like he in this lower station 
but because he's speaking truth, he is continuously um, called on because his speeches are so good. Um, because to heal the country is to heal the Pharaoh. I believe it was a Pharaoh. So to heal the Pharaoh is to feel is to heal the nation and you're being healed through the good speech. Now the farmer is even he's beaten. Um, he is uh, threatened like he is not uh, like held in the high esteem or regard for his petitions they're trying to shut him up but because his speech is so good he continues speaking so not to try to save his life not to get out of any kind of pain no he has to speak truth that is what he has to do um okay i put wow right here so this is the last quote i read the lecture on justice next turns to the possibility of justifiable crime and violence, admonishing the wealthy to be moderate. Violence is for the criminal. Theft suits him who is without his property. Taking property by the criminal is the bad deed of one who is lacking. One cannot be angry with him. He is seeking for himself. Thus, while there is no justification for crime, including necessity, one can at least understand the crime of poor people. Stealing by the well-off, i.e. those satiated with bread and beer, is incomprehensible. Amen. So he, uh, he has a whole indictment against greed, uh, which is great. Not he, the writings do. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, so there, there's a lot to learn from this, but... These appeals should be studied, man. Should be studied. And, um, yeah. He says, uh, greed, which is a pervasive theme in Patahotep, greed generates evil, which causes crime. I've known that deep down for a while. Uh, all right, now let's not, all right, this, this last one. So this is like pre Jesus. Um, he said, uh, and I say pre Jesus because it sounds like stuff you read in the Bible. Um, no silent one have you given his speech. No sleeper have you given his awakening. No downcast have you enlivened. No closed mouth have you opened. No ignorant one have you given his knowledge. No fool have you taught. So these statements add a very profound aspect to the general ethical formulas concerning the duty of a good man. And it sounds just like stuff you read. In the New Testament, like he is the one who gives speech to the silent. He uh, awakens the man that is asleep. He enlivens the downcast. He opens up the closed mouth. He um, gives the ignorant knowledge. He has taught the fool. You know, I mean, these were things that were always deep, deeply in the African tradition. So it pays to know where you come from. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. And uh, yeah, he has a lot of great pictures in the back, man. And good, good book. The next book I'm gonna read is um, uh, American Founders. I think there's some pictures I haven't shown here. I wanna show them all, man. Come on, man. It's all good, it's all good. You know what I'm saying? Keep coming back to Energy Avenue, you know what I'm saying? Check out, check out some other books, keep reading, keep reading. And uh, until next time, later.